blessed and a pleasant day to one and all. My name is Lovely B. Mendoza from BS Ed English 2B, and I am your discussant for regionalism and cultural independence of later period in American literature. But before we proceed to our discussion, I want to ask, how are you doing? I hope that you're all doing well. So without further introduction, let us start learning new things. Learning Objectives Let's do our preparatory activity. Students will analyze the subjects of the shared images on the screen and later will ask to share what emotions do they feel towards this. Let's talk about first regionalism. Regionalism can be thought to as extremely complicated and developed form of local color. You may wonder what does local color mean? To give you knowledge about this, local color is a term applied to fiction or poetry which highlights its setting, being concerned with the characters of a district or of an era as marked by its culture, tradition, beliefs, customs, landscape, costumes, dialect, and other peculiarities that have escaped standardizing cultural influences. The earliest American writing reflects its local, as all literature must, but the local color movement came into particular prominence in the U.S. after the Civil War, perhaps as an attempt to recapture the glamour of a past era or to portray the sections of their united county one to the other. Specifically, American influences upon those authors known as local color writers may be found in Down East humor and in the frontier tradition of all tales. Other influences include the writings of Irving, the English tradition of Scott, Maria Edgeworth, and Bulwer Lytton, and the French romantic tradition of color local represented by Hugo, Marie May and Bernardine de St. Pierre. According to Edward Eggleston, another impact of local color was the racial and national biases of the historical works of Taine, which certainly impelled him to a closer observation of his own region. In local color literature, one finds the dual influence of romanticism and realism, since the author frequently looks away from ordinary life to distant lands, strange customs, or exotic scenes but retains through minute detail a sense of fidelity and accuracy of description. Hippolyte Taine, in full Hippolyte Adolphe Taine, was a French thinker, critic, and historian, one of the most esteemed exponents of 19th century French positivism. He attempted to apply the scientific method to the study of the humanities. His works in English translation include the following below. The Lack of Roaring Comp by Hart in 1868 is usually considered the first local color story. The most distinguished writing engendered by the movement was in the form of short story, whose development was thus deeply affected. Besides Harte, the local color educational institutions produced such prominent authors as Harriet Beecher Stowe, Mary W. Freeman, Sarah Orne Jewett, Rose Terry Cook, and R. E. Robinson in New England, T. N. Page in Virginia, J. C. Harris in Georgia, G. W. Cable and Kate Chopin in Louisiana, Mary N. Murphy and John Fox in Tennessee and Kentucky, John Hay in Illinois, Riley and the Eggleston in Indiana, Clemens in California and on the Mississippi, E. W. Ho, Garland and Zona Gale in the Middle West, and R. H. Davis, H. C. Brunner, Brander Matthews, and O. Henry in New York City. A broader concept of sectional differences lies behind regionalism. The food, shops, and attitudes of the people in a town are an example of local color. The interest or flavor of a locality imparted by the customs and sites peculiar to it. The use of regional detail in a literary or an artistic work. Why is local color important? Local color fiction typically forefronts the distinctive dialect, history, and customs of a specific place or region, often featuring locals outside mainstream American culture. Local color introduced the nation's readers to a variety of little-known regions. 
Going back to regionalism, the authors or writers of regionalism tend to use only one main character, and obviously, that is the protagonist. The reason why is that to provide a clear point of view or perspective throughout the entire story. Regionalist writers tell the story emphatically with depth and emotions from the protagonist's point of views. Furthermore, they usually engage and incorporated local color elements as they were concerned and more of the characteristics of a particular place or region. The characteristics of a region or local include landforms, climate, soil, and natural vegetation. For example, the peaks and valleys of the Rocky Mountains form a physical region. Some regions are distinguished by human characteristics. This may include economic, social, political, and cultural characteristics. With this, the regionalist writers tried to break down an encouraging surface of a particular time and place, yet investigate the psychological character attributes from a more universal or general perspective. According to Renfro, personalities also relate to a region's social attitudes, politics, economy, and health. As for the research conducted by the American Psychological Association, it was proven that people in the friendly and conventional regions are typically less affluent, less educated, more politically conservative, more likely to be protestant, and less healthy compared to people in the other regions. The relaxed and creative state's residents are found to be more culturally and ethnically diverse, more liberal, wealthier, more educated, comparatively healthy, and less likely to be protestant, than those living in other regions. The temperamental and uninhibited region has a larger proportion of women and older adults who are more affluent, politically liberal, and unlikely to be protestant. As for what might have shaped the regional personalities, theories plus research on migration and social influence offer clues, the author said. For instance, research has shown agreeableness is a trait often found in people who stay in their hometowns, and the analysis indicated that a large proportion of residents in the friendly and conventional region lived in the same state the year before. The relaxed and creative region may have been influenced by a frontier mentality that endures with lots of young people, professionals, and immigrants moving to the region for educational and employment opportunities. In the temperamental and uninhibited region, Significant numbers of people have moved away, and the research has shown that people who move to another part of the country are typically high in openness and conscientiousness and low in neuroticism, almost entirely the opposite of the temperamental and uninhibited profile, considering that the temperamental and uninhibited profile is marked by high neuroticism. It's reasonable to speculate that social influence might facilitate the spread of anxiety and irritability across the region, the study said. One of the obvious characteristics of stories produced during the regionalism in American literature is that the stories possess less predictable plot and the characters were tend to be more three-dimensional. However, what really took away regional writers from falling in the category of realist is the possibility that they would become nostalgic, sentimentalist, and contrive to happy ending. For example, in Sarah Orngewitz's A White Heron, the story featured some local color stories characteristics. The story shows the characters speak in a New England dialect. The landscape is detailed in manner. The customs and rituals of farming class families are also described. Moreover, an outsider which is the young male ornithologist comes to this isolated region with a sense of excellence and is frustrated in his endeavors by young Sylvie, who refuses to render the hidden location of the heron. But the story is told from the perspective of Sylvie, and readers have insights into her inner conflict as she tries to make a difficult decision. Through that, we gain knowledge of Sylvie's complexity as a character, a young girl who is faced with making an adult decision, 
an option that will encourage her to face the world from a more mature stance and grow up. Jewett allows the narrator to meddle in order to convince readers to feel sympathy for Sylvie. To wrap up, the story does not express the narrative objectivity of a realistic story. Regionalism has always been used as a word to describe many works by women writers in the late 19th century, but it confined the contributions of these women writers to American literature in a particular style. For example, Mary Wilkins Freeman and Sarah Orne Jewett specifically wrote about the region of New England, but their major focus was on average women in domestic spaces who seek self-agency in a culture where male were dominated. Like Howells, Twain, and James, as established theorists of realism, women writers of the time including Ellen Glasgow and Charlotte Perkins Hillman, who are generally not thought of as regional writers, produced work who frequently withstood strict labeling and which contributed to the beginning of a feminist tradition in American literature. Literary labels help shape the style of stories written in the late 19th century. Some literary works, particularly those that have withstood the test of time, defy reductionism. In American literature, regionalism is fiction in nature, and it includes poetry that deals with the characters' customs, dialect, topography, and other features particular to a specific region. Regional literature covers wider concept of sectional differences. Although in writing out of place, Judith Fetterly and Marjorie Price have argued convincingly that the distinctive characteristic that puts a gap between local color writers from regional writers is instead the condescension and exploitation of toward their subjects that the local color writers portray. Regional literature is a movement that contributed to the reunification of the country after the Civil War and to the building of national identity toward the end of the 19th century. In American literature, the term regionalism is referred to as a distinctive local geography and culture. In addition, it refers to movements that value smaller scaled representations of place over representations of broad territorial range. Regionalism arises from the perspective of modern geographic plurality, where writers and readers understand a larger unit of space to be diversified. Regionalism originates in the post-Civil War era. However, many critics suggest that it originates in the antebellum period when women writers like Harriet Beecher Stowe offer the sketches of rural New England. While Southwestern humorists promoted the style of storytelling and wilderness settings of the nation's frontier territories. In the late 19th century, the term gets used interchangeably with local colors to designate stories set in relatively undeveloped areas such as coastal New England, the South, the Midwest, and California. So, what are the elements of regionalism? Number one is setting. Settings are often remote and inaccessible. The focus is frequently on nature and the limitations it imposes. Setting is fundamental to the story and may sometimes become a character in itself. Number two is the narrator. The person who narrates typically an educated observer from the world beyond who learns a lot from the characters while preserving a sympathetic and ironic distance from them. The narrator's responsibility is to become a jator between the rural folk tale and the urban audience to whom the tale is directed. Number three is character. Regional stories tend to be focused with the characters of the community or region rather than with the individuals. Characters may become stereotypical, character types, and sometimes quaint. The characters are known by their adherence to the traditional and old ways, by dialect, and by particular personality traits central to the region. In women's regional fiction, the heroines are young girls or unmarried women. Number four is plot. Stories revolve around the community and its rituals. It may include lots of storytelling, and it has been said that nothing happens in local stories of women authors, and often, very little thing does happen. 
Number five is theme. Thematic tension or conflict between old-fashioned rural values and urban ways is frequently symbolized by the intrusion of an interloper or outsider who finds something from the community. What are the techniques used by the authors and writers of regionalism? First is the use of dialect to establish the sense of credibility and authenticity of regional characters. Second is the use of complete description from simplest to complex or even seemingly insignificant details central to an understanding of the region. Lastly, often use of a frame story in which the narrator hears some tale of the region. Let us now talk about cultural independence. Cultural independence has proven to be the hardest area for Americans to become free from European models and standards. There are a lot of American artists and intellectuals who recognize the need for American cultural independence. In 1780s, Noah Webster said that America must be as independent in literature as he is in politics. His own main contribution to American cultural independence came through an immensely influential spelling book to standardize the American language. In spite of the importance of Webster's Dictionary, it is still contrasted other early national authors who were less successful. Most popular writers of the post-revolutionary era were wrote strongly patriotic accounts. Like Mercy Otis Warren's History of the Revolution in 1805, and Mason Wims' absolutely popular account of George Washington's life that blasted through countless editions starting in 1800. Moving on the other side, the writers of Philadelphia like Charles Brockden Brown, novelist of the New Republic, attained only a very limited audience with six psychologically troubling novels published from 1798 to 1801. The first American writer to receive both lasting acclaim and popularity was the New Yorker Washington Irving. Some of his famous stars were all drawn on Dutch-American popular culture in his native state and gave audiences such classic characters as R.I.P. Van Winkle and the Headless Horseman. The most celebrated American writer of the new nation was James Fenimore Cooper. His best-known work emphasized the wilderness and its central role, creating America. Cooper's most famous character, Natty Bumpo, who appeared in many novels including The Last of the Mohicans in 1826, was a heroic frontiersman who noticed the nobility of Native Americans even as he was involved in their vanquishing by settling the West. The painter who addressed this problem more directly than others was George Kathleen. He used Indian portraits to raise money and political interest so just to help Native Americans avoid the destruction of their way of life. James Fenimore Cooper in 1826 wrote and published one of the classic of American literature entitled The Last of the Mohicans, a French and Indian war epic that impacted the nation's romantic and tragic perspective on the plight of Native Americans. American cultural innovation was thoughtful in the early republic and in the early national periods. Its major contributions generally focused on subjects that distinguish the United States from Europe, just like the work of the great naturalist painter and engraver, John James Audubon. At the beginning of the 19th century, all Americans, specifically writers and painters, were struggling with the idea of what it meant to be an America. That would be all for my report. I know that you learned something. Once again, I am your lovely Bimandosa, wishing you a great day ahead. Hope you all safe. Bye-bye.